Nine pin. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Okay, what am I looking for? We'll make sure to see. Oh, we're gonna have one more. Okay. 393, 395, eight more. Oh, and everybody, I have more practice tests. Grab a practice test. I know what you're thinking. Why do I give so much? Because I feel free. There, there, the keys in the back. Please don't write on these so I can save them. But they're just they're just more practice questions. It's okay. important to see this. It's a good review. Okay, okay. Twenty-seven questions. You guys should get it done in about I don't think even no longer than six minutes. Twenty-five minutes. Okay, can I write it on a post-it note? Uh, no, I want it on a sheet. Because the rock around the post-it note is I'll lose it. I'll give you some. No, 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 on your own. But we will next week do some very hard. Are we taking this home? Yep, taking this home. Okay, okay. Do not write on You write on your own. Yeah, yeah. Suck it. So that way, they're good questions. I can use it again and I'll do it. So don't write on it so I can use it again. I like somebody, I'm one of these, a uh, couple of people wrote, don't write on this. I thought that was kind of funny. Just grab one. They're all the same. Some are two sheets on one, some are one sheet. I would like to note that I will sign for a slave holder one aid independent. Slave hold, do you want a what? A double note writing on the same thing, and if what I can note, sign for loud sign or slave holder one aid independent. Wow. Yeah, don't write. Huh? You already wrote on it? No, no, I was going to say, number one, other part, but I did not write on it. Okay, so you can take this home, just do it on your own. It's a really it's good practice. Next week, we will do some in class. We will sit down and do a practice set. It's the same. Some have two oh, sheets okay. on one, some have one sheet on one. It's all the same. It's done on the college board. So the questions are close to the style they write. Everything is relative, you know. They, I just, I, I said I gave you some points for the raise within, so I did. Yep, that will be. I'll get that in you. Okay, yeah, get it, get it. But you were gone to the student when I met I know you have to watch it, but it should be, it's online, it should work. Yeah. Hey, make a plug. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Uh, I'll take a bite. I, I said originally we're going to take a bite. And I'll give you another one. We'll do some class. And just seeing the questions. Multiple choice. Huh? Yeah, the keys in the back. The keys on the last page. Obviously, wait till you're done. <laughs> Then do a lot of good text before. And the big thing about this one is it's not graded on the AP exam is not in the 90, 80, 70 scale. I got close. They grade somewhat on a curve, but I'm telling you right now, you get over 60% correct, you've done fine. You've done fine. That's good. So don't worry about getting 90%. Now, obviously, you have to get them all right, but you're going to miss a few. And that's the way it is. Did you see that? Yeah, air pressure. Sixty percent. You've done. You've done well. You know, set. Obviously, you want to get a little. Obviously, you want to do better. But don't worry if you miss some. If you miss five or six, it's not that big of a deal. They write them in such a way you're going to miss some. And so, please have this done by the end of the week. And I've got another one. I'll give you another practice test too. Oh, and I. I was kind of hemming and hawing. So on 702 in your review book, there's that whole practice test. If you do the multiple choice and, you, and just turn that in on Monday, I'll give you some extra credit. Sound good?
I'm just, I'll reward you for practicing. Not a lot, but a little bit. I didn't put that on the board. I'm kind of leaving it because I didn't know I'm doing 60s and then we'll see where we're at. Yeah. 702. So it's, it's after the last unit. And review session. So it, it looks like we will be in the auditorium. And that's a little better. I thought about the library, but frankly, I don't like the chairs in the library. So you have to sit in the library for a while. They're not, there's some really nice ones, but the ones around the tables in that little, little classroom area. And it's not quite big enough anyways. So we will be in the auditorium on Sunday, 6 a.m. If I'm not here, wait for me. I promise I'll be here. Just wait. Relax. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. I know it's 6 p.m. And but you you figure it out because you're all very, very talented and spry. Also, if everything works out right, I'll be able to open up that side door of the auditorium so we just park out by the practice field and come right in there. And same thing Wednesday at 6 30. I just sent in the ask the uh, request for the reservation. Everything can work out fine. I know the play is over on Sunday, yeah, Saturday night, so it should work out perfect. And so, where do we finish in here? Where? Oh, ich bin ein Berliner. And so, what's that? No, we're, we're doing practice sets in class. Next week, this is just for you to take off. Because I didn't want you to ride on them, so I so you would turn them both in, so I could save it, use it again next year. And what am I looking for? Where where am I? So we got each bit on Berlin and Soviet desperation. What was the attempted invasion of Cuba called? Yeah, Bay of Pigs. What was the very successful now democratic plan to make the republicans specifically nixon look soft on communism yeah the missile gap remember the democrats did the, or the republicans did the bomber gap eight years earlier and oh what was kennedy's program called new frontier. yeah the new frontier to finish off what yeah the new deal and the fair deal really only one thing passed what was the only real success kennedy had for his but for its um, initiatives? Defense. Yeah, defense spending. Massive increases in defense spending. Partially in Vietnam. But let's get to this. So, ich bin ein Berliner. Berliner. Okay. And eventually it's devolved into stalemate. It actually less tensions. In the long run, without the brain drain, the tensions drop, the threat of war drop, and even though it was so scary, I like on the western side soon, the wall became a site for graffiti. And here, this is the 1970s and some tourists. A lot of West Berliners just came to accept that they live in an island. And they got out of the draft, so they would move there. This is a picture taken from the um, burnt out hulk of the Reichstag, which is literally right on the wall. And there's the wall, there's the Brandenburg Gate. Today, this is all buildings. The U.S. Embassy is right here. Uh, there's a memorial to the Holocaust right here. The Tear Garden Park. Uh, and this was all landmines and machines. Yeah. The United, they're the German army, the West German army. Every young man, when they turn 18, they're in. So they reinstate the draft. Every, every country in Europe had the draft all through the Cold War, except for Britain. France had the draft, Belgium had the draft, the Netherlands had, Luxembourg had the draft. Huh? Uh, Switzerland, they don't have the draft, but every young man and woman's in the militia. Yeah. There's a few parts that are left. There's a, uh, there's a couple stretches. One, it's a stretch, now they've turned into like a, a living museum of the wall. And so you, you, there's a night, a cool museum where you go up and you look down on the wall, and they have a couple of the towers still there, but most of it's gone now. But they have a, a they have a, um, 
little thin layer of bricks in the ground to show where the wall is. And so like, a, what is it, Berliner Platz, this big plaza that used to be nothing, but now it's like this big uh, shopping center and uh, media center, the wall goes right through the middle, little bricks. So they memorialize it. And they got all the graffiti on it. I have a piece of the wall. Yeah, I went and took it. They didn't seem to mind. So when I was at the Czech Fort Charlie Museum, <laughs> I got a piece of the wall. Actually, I got three pieces. You could buy them. Because when they took them down, they just came through in hammers and chopped it up. And it, you can see a little bit of the paint graffiti on it. So I kept it in a little bag. It's my certificate of uh, authenticity. I'll let you pass on look at it. But you look at you see some of the painting for the graffiti on there. And even though the Cold War, in reality, tensions would drop because of this, Kennedy was still very embarrassed by the Bay of Pigs. So in secret, he didn't trust the CIA. So he did it actually through the Attorney General's office, which was his brother, Robert Kennedy. Kind of a major conflict of interest. Uh, but they did Operation Mongoose which was a top secret plan to assassinate Castro. And they even included, this is a picture from the five families, organized crime that was mad that Castro kicked out the casinos. And this was mostly kind of farcical. They had these strange things like exploding cigars, exploding seashells, um, running get LSD into his water supply so he would act really weird at his speech and lose credibility. Huh? Oh, okay, yeah. But the point is, uh, some were legit. You know, they, they had a former mistress, mistress in 1961 when he spoke at the UN, meet him, and she had a gun. And he took it. In fact, did the kind of the uh, bad movie line, but this really happens. If you're going to do it, shoot. She lost her nerve. And so they never did actually assassinate Castro. But the point is, no one in America really knew outside of the Kennedy administration and a few of the CIA and the Justice Department for this illegal assassination. Who knew about the assassination attempts on Castro? Castro! They already invaded and he's mad. Yes. Uh, yeah, almost, except for the fact that they also were threatening nuclear war, so that also took away a little bit of the humor. And speaking of that, this is going to lead to something very interesting. Castro and Khrushchev felt weak. They both felt weak. And they both felt they needed a way to deter an attack by the United States. Castro knew the United States wanted to invade and would probably do it again and try to kill them. Khrushchev knew the United States had massive superiority in nuclear weapons, and he was trying to save the Soviet system by not pumping all their limited resources into weapons. But by the way, they did actually get a fake cigar with a mine in it into Castro's um, cigars, but it was like twice as big. So he had to figure it out, like, oh, this is weird. But I just find it really funny, in 63, Mad Magazine actually had kind of a picture of the big exploding cigar. No idea this actually happened. And so this is going to lead. You could probably guess what's going to happen. And by the way, friends to the end, right? This is a lot of an enemy of my enemy. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Two weeks, October 14th to October 28th, 1962. And this would be maybe not the closest, but the closest very public that the, that the world came to nuclear war. It came really close in 1983, but this was mostly within the deep confines of the Soviet Union. And most, of, most people, myself included, had no idea, thankfully. And in 1979, we came within 30 seconds from blowing the world up. But other than that, I will tell you that story after the exam. It's actually kind of a scary story. 
Once again, I was asleep. So with that, this is a good cartoon. Here it shows them both on the hydrogen bombs. You know, Kennedy's hydrogen bomb is here and his fingers on the button. Khrushchev's hydrogen bomb. And they're arm wrestling, so all the politics. But this is so clever because they're threatening nuclear war and they're arm wrestling. What's going to happen if Kennedy wins? Yeah. See that? He's just going to bang right on the button. So what are you really fighting about? You're threatening it, and if one of you wins, you're actually going to do it. The point is, are there any winners? So that's a good cartoon. Yes. Actually, a little bit, but this was already, this was made by a book that was done uh, in the late 1950s. But the point is, is that people are already kind of thinking about it. And so, an illegal flight, yes, I can't emphasize this enough, these were illegal. The United States was violating international law. They were just taunting the Cubans. On October, oh, October 14th, a U-2 came back and its film was developed, and it was clear there were missile sites being developed. Medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles. So Russia didn't have many ICBMs, but they had more of these intermediate range missiles. And they were being put on Cuba, and look, that's only 90 miles from Florida. Now, there are also other Soviet soldiers there, training Cuban soldiers. Soviet soldiers were manning surface-to-air missiles, and there were Soviet pilots training and flying Cuban planes and Cuban bombers. But the missiles were a threat. And the point is, once Kennedy saw this, he realized no American president could tolerate missiles that close to the United States. You think about it for a second. The medium range missiles could reach Washington, D.C. The intermediate, intermediate range missiles could reach almost all the continent of the United States. That means a missile could hit Washington, D.C. in less than 10 minutes. That's not enough time. Now, I should add, the United States still had missiles in Turkey and Italy. Turkey right on the border of the Soviet Union. We had them there, but no American president could tolerate them that close to the U.S. Think about the election of 64. Think how the Republicans would hammer him for some kind of missile gap. So this is politics, too. But let's be clear about it. These are very defensive weapons to the United States, but the United States immediately assumed they're getting ready for a surprise attack. So they had a choice to make. What do we do about these weapons? There were four choices. So they thought of invasion. The problem with invasion, and the same problem with an airstrike. Will, jerk, will the Soviets do something about Berlin? They were talking about Berlin all the time. Remember, because of the wall now that Berlin, East and West Berlin really became the focal point of the Cold War. Could the Soviets just swallow it up? Who knows what they could do? And also, our pallets are being trained for nuclear war. Could they really drop iron free fall bombs on a site that small? The answer is probably not. So it probably wouldn't work. It would require invasion that could lead to World War III. Diplomacy. And the Russian foreign minister, Gromyko, actually was in Washington, D.C. four days after Kennedy found out. But this worked, and this is what you have to add. This to the Kennedy administration seemed, it seemed weak to talk about it. Because even if it works, Kennedy might be betrayed as being soft on communism because he was willing to just talk about it, allowing these missiles to be established, and then it's too late. And so they refused to use diplomacy. And they could have done diplomacy in secret, at least for a couple days, but they decided not to. And so what they decided upon was this, a quarantine. It's actually a blockade. But a quarantine, a blockade is an act of war, so they called it a quarantine. And they would stop Soviet ships coming into Cuba. Originally 200, they eventually made it about 100 miles from Cuba. What they said is the U.S. Navy will stop them and search for missile components. And said that the United States will not, will keep this quarantine going until the Soviets remove those missiles. Kennedy announced it on national TV that, that night. Nobody had any inkling of this. In fact, Kennedy did a couple did a couple public appearances and did fake illness. Went back to Washington, D.C. for two days, was 
No one saw. And then all of a sudden he's on national television. All three television networks agree about him. It's prime time. Kennedy gave a speech, and overnight we're on the edge of nuclear war. And they told everybody, prepare, get ready, know where your fallout shelters are. There'll be no warnings. You hear the sirens, it's the real thing. It's the real thing. So all over the Western world for the next week on the edge of nuclear war. And it was very public. Everybody knew. Everybody was scared. And oh, I thought I put I thought I clipped this. Didn't work. The Cuba Missile Crisis, October 22nd. And yeah. Uh, or authoritarian. It's something. Could be fascist. I don't know. <laughs> I've heard people say stuff like that. Uh, yeah. That'd be, that'd be a shock to people who believe that. So, what we have here is immediate panic. And so here, I, this, I like this scene that this is a television shop. You see, they're all looking at the TV and you can see the other side. They're watching in a, in a, uh, in a basically a furniture store where they're selling TVs. Here, this came out in Atlantic Magazine two days later, how to dig a fallout shelter in your backyard. You would dig and live in this little trench covered up by your door for two weeks. Here was panic beginning food. And these people's cleared out the stores all over the Western world. So that's Europe. Um, and Japan, but also Canada, United States, yeah. Not the explosion, but the thought was they would at least give you some protection from the fallout. Like if it landed on the fire. Yeah, so let's say they fired missiles in that, that hit great fallout, so mm -hmm. that's what bombed the missiles are. Might give some of the basement capitals. Seconds. Would it really protect? Well, then after two weeks, then. Oh, they would have been the blast radius of the. It depends on the blast radius of the bomb. They have one as big as one megaton, and so that would have been enough to knock on this. Yes. Um, Brown, are you throwing structures back that actually survive? Oh no, no. These are purely designed for fallout. Yeah, I'm asking if it's like that, that it exists. Yes. Not a direct hit. You know, there were a few like Cheyenne Mountain, they dug a massive tunnel underneath the mountain in Colorado that would withstand probably maybe a one megaton blast, but not two megaton. And there are a few bomb shelters for like all the members of Congress in the mountains of West Virginia, one in Pennsylvania. But for example, now in nuclear war, the president would be up in the front. And these fallout shelters told everyone fine where this is, but you've probably seen they're still around. When I was a kid, I looked for these. Always want to know. Always want to know. Don't you miss that fun? Don't you feel bad? Who knows? It might be back. And the panic would even go to the uh, screen doors. <laughs> I had no other way to use this picture, so I figured I'd show this. Kitten's ox caught on a screen door. Yeah, every day is like that. I don't even know where these cats come from. I don't know where I found that picture. I just thought it was funny. So, on the 24th, the first Soviet ships arrived. And they originally, 100 miles from Cuba, they actually increase their speed. U.S. Navy ships stop them, but the last second they hit, they all stop and then float. And what that meant is the Soviets were not going to try to run blockade, run the blockade. U.S. Navy ships didn't have to shoot at them, and that would have escalated to nuclear war. Wow, would it have ever? That's something we would find out in the 1990s. Yeah, it would have been nuclear war. And thus, once this happened, they could begin some kind of negotiation, but there was no direct communication between the White House and the front. And so they had to do things like secret communication between the embassies, meet in restaurants, or by radio broadcasts, shortwave radio broadcasts on Radio Moscow or Radio Free Europe. 
And this on this day, and then four times on the 26th, it almost happened. Nuclear war. It came so close, it's hard to even imagine today. I can't tell you those stories because they're watching. But after the exam, I'll tell you those stories. Sound good? They're good stories for after the exam. But on the 28th, an agreement was finally made. The United States agreed they will not invade Cuba. I should add a lot of very uh, rabid anti-communists were furious at Kennedy for doing this. The Soviets agreed to remove the missiles. Many in the Soviet Union, hardliners are furious at Castro. And so they agreed. Tensions were eased. I'll tell you another story about that happening, but in secret, the United States was already planning on removing the obsolete missiles from Turkey and Italy. They, we don't need them anymore. With the, now we have Minuteman missiles around Great Falls. But in secret, the U.S. agreed to remove them soon. But this had to be secret. The Canadian administration told the Soviets, if you tell people this, we won't remove them, even though we were going to anyways. And they didn't want to make it look like blackmail. And so the Cuban Missile Crisis ended just to the brink of war. It was so close. Kennedy's uh, reputation would go up for a while, but then other events, it would go down dramatically. And his popularity was at the lowest it had ever been by the fall of 1963, a year afterwards. Khrushchev, right away, hardliners were mad at Khrushchev. But two things will come out of this, from the brink of war, a limited test bed. Both countries agreed to stop at least the atmospheric testing. So no more testing in Nevada above ground. They still did tests below ground up until the 80s. And a hotline connecting the Kremlin and the White House. Now, I always had the vision of like a red phone. They pick it up, give me the Kremlin. But it was actually a telegraph form. They would do it by Morse code. <laughs> that was seen as more secure. And so, good cartoon. Kennedy, Khrushchev, nuclear war. You know, let's lock this. Let's get a lock to this one. Did they? Eh, kind of. But ironically, Khrushchev, who did say he could save Cuba, back at home, he was humiliated. And since he was not the supreme leader, other members of the Politburo, finally in a power play, and I didn't write the year down, 1964, he was ousted from power. And this actually would be the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. And would end, help end the Cold War in 1989. Hardliners that took power. Here's Leonid Brezhnev, which I'll get to again on Thursday. They vowed to never fall behind again. And 50% of the Soviet economy by the end of the decade was solely involved in weapons. Yeah. 65, 64. And this is going to lead to the Soviet economic collapse of the 19th. Because there's going to be food shortages, clothing shortages, because everything's going to go to weapons. I should add one more thing I didn't have to this. And so after Sputnik and NASA, there was a space race. And I'll come back to this. But a space race between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the goal was who would be the first country to do what? Land on the sun. And the thing was the moon. This ended the Soviet effort. We didn't know this at the time, but all their all their money is going to go into ICBMs like this Saturn missile, which I always call Satan, but it's Saturn. And they did. That's how come they lost the space race. Now they might have lost it anyways because the Americans were ahead of them, but still, that's the big reason. And so in the 80s, when the Soviet, by 1979, 1980, the Soviet economy was barely hanging on. And it began free fall by 82, 83. That's probably the reason why they nearly went to war in 83. And in 89, the reforms to try to save it would allow for Eastern European countries to break away, leading to the collapse of the British Party. And so you can see the end of the Cold War right here. By the way, Soviets got really big into medals in World War II. Here's Leonid Brezhnev, their kind of halfway Stalinist leader of the Soviet Union in the 70s. That was my vision of the Soviet Union was this one. And those eyeballs. We'll come back to Russian. And so I think we need a palate cleanser. Who's with me? Okay. Palate cleanser.
Yeah, is this good? President. I'll never get to my research. Okay, so, but part of what was going on in the 1960s, remember, nothing happens in a vacuum. We, that's one of the things I really like about the Rage Within. It set up now the fight for civil rights, and the sides were organized. We talked about the war in court, court when I talked about Brown versus the Vegan Board of Education during the video. And the big thing was civil rights under the context of the 14th Amendment. And this is that the Bill of Rights apply to the states. Before the Civil War, the Bill of Rights did not apply to anything but the federal government. That's why the Civil War and Reconstruction really created what we think of as rights in this country. The Civil War and the unfinished business of Reconstruction. In a way, it's also to finish Reconstruction. And there is going to be a pretty full-scale conservative backlash. Now, I put this picture up, and then I accidentally forgot to change it. The John Birch Society came out after Earl Warren. And I thought I grabbed this picture, and then I thought, oh, that picture is better. It was in Peach Earl Warren, and it was on billboards. They put these all over the John Birch Society. And then I saw this picture, I thought, oh, that's even clearer, it's a better picture. But it doesn't say Peach Earl Warren, I didn't realize it until I got it. Will you forgive me? No. Wow, you guys are tough. In my day, well, I'm doing this. Why don't we listen to a little song? <laughs> there we go. In P. Earl Warren, one of these was outside of my hometown in beautiful Miles City because he, it was up there years after he had already retired. In 1968. But there's going to be a massive backlash against this. But I can't emphasize this enough. We're talking 14th Amendment. That's one that guarantees the Bill of Rights. And that is our concept of civil rights. That term really does come from, at least to the American point of view, the 14th Amendment. And even though most people think about civil rights as differences in rights between or based on color of skin, it's also rights for religion, creed, and we'll get to sex. And so the big element here was the first thing to get rid of Jim Crow, attack the segregation laws. So remember Rosa Park? This is from an elementary textbook that was done about 10 years. That's not bad. We talked about this in class. You said it. That look about right. Everyone got that? Yeah, so that looked about right. And you know, it's for the kids. It says, you know, that's exactly pretty much what happened. The same textbook company altered it a little bit. This was their proposal for next year's textbook, literally 2023-24 school year. Little. So it doesn't say that, right? But of course, this is now illegal in, in uh, about eight states. So this is the textbook that actually came out. Are you ready for this? I figured I'll show it too, because it's still, at least for a while, legal in Montana. That's what eventually came. Do you see what happens here? Yeah, it just says she had shown courage. I'm talking about racism. Well, so, I don't know. so that's what they're fighting against. And I thought, yeah, let's talk about the way history is presented. So this is kind of a big deal. And God, yeah, neither one mentioned her arrest. Or how that affects no. the civil rights movement. No, it's for elementary school, so you can have like, you know, how much do you really want to show? But high schools are just the same. This was high school textbooks are just the same. This one just shows how stark the reality was. Texas and Florida, they buy all the textbooks for every school in by the, for the state. 
And so that means they're a huge market, so the textbooks adapt to their laws. Does that make sense? And what are their laws? We're not going to talk about it. Speaking of that, we are. The Southern Christian Leadership uh, Conference. Now, the one, there are a number of leaders. Walter Abernathy might have been the most important leader, but Martin Luther King uh, would become the president of it after, after what happened to Montgomery. He was incredibly intelligent, a great organizer. And let's be clear, this is politics. You're not going to find anybody with, who could persuade people like Martin Luther King. And so you have to persuade. There are two main attacks on Jim Crow. One was sitting, sitting in on segregated restaurants. These are two different restaurants in North Carolina. So very brave young men and women, of whatever color of skin, different color of skin, college age, volunteer to go sit together in, in segregated restaurants and challenge the Jim Crow laws which after Rosa Parks, they were very scared to arrest. They can understand why. And so here are people intimidating them, dumping their milkshake on their head, dumping a glass of water on their head. And it shows the courage of, remember the idea of civil disobedience. Which side is justice? The people sitting at the table or these people? If you're trying to show what, why laws are unjust, that's why this is a valuable tool, but really hard to do. Yeah. White and black people, college age, young men and women, incredibly brave because they're risking their life. The only thing is they also know that people are watching. These, both these two counters, this one and this one are the, in the Smithsonian Museum of American History. And another one were called the Freedom Riders. And they would try to um, go on buses. They would integrate white and black, same age, and they would go two things, challenge Plessy versus Ferguson, you know, separate but equal, but also by for voting rights, trying to register black voters to try to show how this wasn't allowed. And a number would be murdered or attacked, showed incredible courage. These are the rise in 61. Now their point is, yeah, they want to show what's going on here, but what do they want? Both of these things want, and that's what we have to get, federal law. The federal government has the power for voting rights. The federal government has the power under the 14th Amendment. They're not going to get Alabama to change, per se, but they can get the federal government to. And that's going to lead to, outside of Birmingham, Alabama, I don't know why it does this. I don't know why it's doing this. Outside of Birmingham, Alabama, a bus was stopped. The state police surrounded it and then basically sat, um, arrested everybody on the bus, and then somebody firebombed the bus. So I got to restart this whole thing. That really annoys me. All right. And so. When they went back to try to save the bus that they firebombed, the state police beat them with their nightsticks and beat a couple nearly to death. That's John Lewis, who would later be elected to the United States House and be elected for almost 40 years. He passed away last year. It's Jaws Lake. It's hard to see, but that's a piece of a little indent. He would have that for the rest of his life. Here, he's pulling out a tooth that got knocked out. Yeah. Yeah, it was white. I mean, there are white people on with free with the freedom rights too. And so, you know, it, so don't think in terms of whites attacking blacks. It was people who wanted to say okay, should have that you know hidden that same Yeah. They 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 they're taken off by the state police and then they fire them. Okay. So they 
the plan wasn't to murder them, or at least, or if they, the plan was to murder them, they did they were on the time. I don't think they would have minded. Okay. What was the point of attacking Intimidating them. They didn't want to kill them, but intimidate them to leave so they don't do any more freedom riders. You're going to come down and risk that? Are you going to come down and do that? Anybody volunteering? Takes a lot of guts, doesn't it? A lot of guts. But the whole goal is to get action. And that would be personified by something Kennedy did not want. Oh, almost forgot. I forgot one thing. So back to Alabama. George Wallace. He was the governor of Alabama. The segregationist governor. He even said he would stand in the schoolhouse door to stop segregation. Here he is at the University of Alabama. And his inaugural address, you don't have to write this down, just make sure you know George Wallace. His inaugural address when he was elected governor was, I think this pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Now, why am I mentioning American history broad? We have a lot of it to cover. Remember Strong Thurmond in 48? He's ran with the Dixiecrats in 48, splitting the Democrats. Wallace would do the same thing in 68, with the same goal, segregation. Wallace did it in 68. This time it worked for the Republicans, but the Democrats split that allowed Richard Nixon to be elected. Yes. Completely for segregation now, segregation forever. Yeah. I'm not surprised. It's one of the most famous quotes in the 1960s. Yeah, so it doesn't really surprise me, but. And by the way, these are, uh, they call them state police in Alabama. Partially to make sure that they, their, their main goal was to stop like the Freedom Riders. And Birmingham would be the center of the fight for integration. And here are city police seeking guard dogs. And one of the symbols of the civil rights movement this time, peaceful protesters, which has been attacking peaceful protesters. It's a very, it's a very, uh, Normal thing to attack and intimidate them, it's happened yesterday here, would be a uh, fireworks. Here, as in in Helen. Yeah, okay. And the point about this is if you ever been about hmm, the, the attacks on uh, transgender rights in the state of and there was a, a piece of protest on top, and then went to the gallery. Some people started to, um, we're not going to go all the details of what happened, but they started to shout protests so that everybody is heard and the Speaker of the House called in the uh, sheriff. And they came in and rioted. The law passed. Yeah. What kind of hoses? Hmm? Fire hoses. And in fire hoses, you ever put the pressure on a fire hose? And it hurts. And so that became one of the symbols. And this is going to lead to Kennedy push for civil rights as, as a campaign or as a candidate, but the bill was stalled. And so in, in August 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And this march was designed to make Kennedy act. Kennedy actually begged, he actually personally called. Many of the leaders, Walter Ruther, the head of the United Auto Workers, unions were very pro-civil rights. The, the, the leadership, not all the members, because they're people like anybody else. He also a person called Martin Luther King and begged him not to do it, but they said no. Then the whole goal of protest is to force some, the people in power to be uncomfortable and make them act. That's part of the reason why they hate it. Nobody likes to be uncomfortable. Here is the crowd looking back at, uh, or looking back from the Lincoln Memorial where the speeches were given. And the big thing was not just for civil rights or any Jim Crow laws. It was also the economic justice that comes with it. If people are denied the ability to participate in the commercial world, how can they possibly have equal economic rights? If you cannot participate in the same stores, you cannot participate in the same market as other people. And the market who makes the rules for the market? The government. They make the money, they decide its values, they make the laws, they enforce it. 
And so they're saying, you must allow us to participate using the same money as anybody else. Martin Luther King would give one of his more famous speeches there, where he said, this will be a tireless fight, but we're going to have to demand economic justice. I'll play you a little bit more of that. I'll wait till after the test. He also kind of went into a shtick. He had this shtick about um, the, the imaginary world after the fact. I was finding it very funny. If you look at the pictures of him, Walter Abernathy, one of his best friends, is going, oh, God, he's doing this. The part he never won close. He has a dream. That he did, and all, the, all his friends are like, ah, he always does this. It's a good finisher, though. It was a fire and brimstone speech. And with that, we have all these things going on. There is going to be a huge conservative backlash. And the claims that this was part of a communist dread or people plot. This sign of Martin Luther King at a Baptist convention was posted all over this billboard, all over the South, saying him at communist training school. And that's King. It's simply not true at all. I should add, King was a democratic socialist. He's kind of a moderate socialist, you would say, like, but certainly wasn't a communist. And here about forced integration creates racial hatred. And this was a Gallup poll taken after the March on Washington. And look at the unfavorable rating in 1963 to the civil rights movement. And so these were very brave people going against what was a lot of public popular opinion amongst a lot of different people in the United States. And one of the things that's going to start in the 1960s, once they started this forced, in, forced integration, almost immediately, segregation academies were appearing. And these were not hidden at all. These were all white private schools. And some were religious, some weren't. This actually became a huge deal about the tax status of them in the 1970s, a massive deal. But they're therefore going to be anti-public education. Why public education is required in the front. And it's actually going to be a very effective attack on public education, kind of personified by charter schools today, which is what are coming to Montana next year. And here is the Claiborne Academy. This is a uh, two years ago. But it, they don't really hide it. They don't hide it at all. And here's a pamphlet for this is uh, the Council School Foundation to set up these private schools in Jackson, Mississippi in, in the mid 1960s. And then it talks about the right type of students who will be coming to the school. Yeah, they literally called them segregation academies. And it's going to be mostly white. It's going to be a huge deal in the 1970s about their tax status. Massive deal. But while this is going on, South Vietnam is blowing up. Nothing happens in a vacuum. It's not like we have this civil rights thing in one little pocket. And has no relationship to what's happening in the Cold War, or for that matter, in Vietnam, or for that matter, anywhere else. They're all related. They're all tied together. South Vietnam, remember, Eisenhower sent troops to as advisors. The first American soldier in South Vietnam died in 1959. Who were the people that the South Vietnamese army was fighting? What were they? Yeah, the Viet Cong or the National Liberation Front. And their goal was what? The Viet Cong's goal was what? Yeah. Unite North and South Vietnam. One Vietnam, right? So what's the American goal? Two Vietnams. So we're getting involved in a civil war in South Vietnam. And as the U.S. sent advisors, North Vietnam sent advisors. Not as many, but for guerrilla war, you don't need as many. You hit and run, you go to the jungle, you threaten everywhere. Stay in the fight. Here's an American advisor. That's Green Beret right there. He's not wearing a beret, I know. Those are American helicopters piloted by Americans ferrying South Vietnamese troops in the battle. This is before we were officially at war. Kennedy would increase the number of advisors from about 1,500 to 18,000 and millions of dollars. And the U.S. Navy involved in actions in the North, top secret missions. So the reasons he's committed. We already know about the domino coup. And don't forget Berlin. They always talked about Berlin. But there's something else, too. Civil rights. The issue of civil rights. Kennedy is hammered about this. Its popularity has gone down because 
no action has been done on civil rights, and there's a lot of backlash against the civil rights movement and the protests. And also, he wants to look tough on communism. And he realizes, he's thinking, I can't get reelected, which is just so amazing. He was willing to go to the brink of nuclear war the year earlier. And now, he's got to show he's even tougher on communism. It's like this never-ending fight that has to happen. This is all Truman Doctrine thinking, and it goes, it never really ends for American history. Yeah. So, the civil rights movement, the Civil Rights he was losing fearlessly. He needed a win, exactly. He okay. needed some kind of win. And he also thought, maybe correctly, I'll never get civil rights if I lose a war. And, but it's all coming back, if I lose in Vietnam, Berlin's next. Now, that really doesn't make sense, but that's the way they were thinking. Yeah. Very much. But it just didn't really fight for it. Kennedy proposed it and then let it just die in Collins. He was unwilling to risk too much of his own personal uh, prestige. He was not the next president. Lyndon Johnson would risk everything. But he was also Lyndon Johnson. There's nobody like Lyndon Johnson. That's both very good and also very bad. So remember Zim. He was that corrupt leader of South Vietnam. He was Catholic in a majority Buddhist country. He was known for nepotism, outright thievery. He got really rich off U.S. government aid. Zim was becoming less and less popular. In fact, by 63, Viet Cong forces had infiltrated much of the countryside here. Will be trading down here. He was in real trouble. American advisors were saying, we'll be lucky if South Vietnam survives until the election of 64. That's how bad it was. And so these scenes started getting back to the United States of Buddhist monks protesting the Zim regime. regime. They're not necessarily, in fact, they're not pro Viet Cong. They might want one Vietnam, but they're not pro Viet Cong but they're anti-Zim. And scenes of them committing suicide by lighting themselves on fire, these public displays to show their willing to sacrifice to end the Zim administration really, really shows one important thing. We're not winning. We're losing. These kind of scenes, my guess is most of you have probably seen one or two of these scenes. Yeah, they're, they're not Viet Cong. They're protesting, or they're not protesting the Americans directly. They're protesting the Zim regime. And so when generals in the South Vietnamese Army approached the United States CIA in August for a coup, the U.S. gave reluctant, but a, they gave approval. The U.S. didn't put Zim in power. And they were they might be tied to the coup, but they agreed to it. And there would be a coup against Zim to overthrow the government overthrow the government. But in the process of overthrowing Zim, they brutally murdered him. That is Zim's body. It's, I purposely chose the not black and white one. And here's the problem. Everybody thought the U.S. did it. The U.S. didn't do it, but we gave our approval. And now it's stuck. Tomorrow we finish this. I don't think I've had a sugar baby in 40 years. And you ate them all. Oh, that's good. I feel better now. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Covered a lot today. Boy, the 60s, a lot happened. No, not necessarily. But 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 what happens is it's 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 combination of a kind of public waste. And so what they are is even though they'll be funded by the law that's and the most extreme of these laws, it will be public money will fund them government money, but instead of going to school, public schools, it will go to the private companies, individuals, and maybe even religious groups who start doing this. Can I swear for a bit? Oh. Oh.
but I, I appreciate your attitude. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I'm not I gotta shut the camera off. Say goodbye. Bye.